Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Crockett, Texas. It's a joy for me to welcome each of you here that are present with us today and those of you who are watching on our live stream with Facebook and listening on KIVY. Thank you for tuning in. I do hope all of you before you leave this morning will take a moment to register your attendance. And if you're viewing on our Facebook live stream, please check in, sign in with us. Uh, say good morning or just give us your name. We'd love to know who's watching. I have a few announcements to share this morning. I'd like to remind you, first of all, about our new pictorial directory. We're just needing 11 more persons to sign up, but we're getting awfully close to the deadline, which is, uh, what, December the 7th, I believe. So I do hope that you will uh, sign up. Uh, give us a call if you need some help. I know Ellen can help you out. Uh, also, and uh, we, we'd sure love to have a directory this year, but only you can make it happen. So uh, please uh, work with us on this. It'll, it'll help your staff and it'll help uh, some of the new members get to know you as well. I do want to assure you regarding the directory, uh, we keep all of this information private. We don't just hand out directories to anyone that asks them. Uh, that, that, that is uh, against our rules. So your information will be kept totally private. With all that uh, being said, let me invite you now to join with me as we sing together our choral call to worship as um, the Cowan family will be bringing the uh, lighting of the Advent candle. Kathy and family will. Today we begin the Advent journey to Bethlehem. For Joseph and Mary, it was a grueling journey from Nazareth in Galilee to their ancestral home in Bethlehem. But, but just, just as God, God is, is with us, us in the journeys of our lives, God was with them, giving hope, preparing the way, even as the prophet predicted. predicted. Hear these words from Isaiah 43 through 5. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall, be, be, shall become level, the rugged places a plain and and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We light this candle to, procra to proclaim that Christ is the light of the world, to announce that by bringing light into the world, Christ has brought hope through Christ our Lord, assures us that God that good will be ultimately triumph over evil. Mm -hmm. And that by living in the light of Christ, we too can bring hope to the world. Let us, pr let us pray together. Oh God, oh God who gave us the light, light thank, thank you, you for, for giving, giving us hope, hope in, the in the form of a child at Bethlehem as we prepare to celebrate of the birth of the Holy Child, may we be willing to your be servants, lightening the candle of hope in the darkness of despair. Amen.
Thank you to the Calvert family for that wonderful reading. Did a great job there. Let me now invite you all to stand for our opening hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 196, in your hymn book. We believe in God, the creator of all things, and lover of our souls. He is the origin and destiny of all. We believe in Jesus Christ, the coming of the baby emerges as a herald of hope. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who implants the seed of truth within us, bring us to the birth of the body of Christ, and empowers us to confront and transform all that is corrupted, degraded, and deceitful. We believe in the coming reign of God. It is drawn near to us in Jesus, and will be consummated in the glorious marriage of earth and heaven. For the coming of that day, on this day, we work and pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come. I would like to call to your attention uh, the needs of a family who has just suffered the loss. Uh, George Cook passed away this last week, and uh, services will be held for him uh, later this week on Saturday. The family has requested that this be a private funeral just for the family, uh, so we want to keep them in our prayers and, and lift them up uh, consistently. Uh, for God's peace and comfort to, uh, to embrace them. I also bring to your attention the uh, names on our list 
our uh, prayer list in, on your bulletin. Please keep them before you as well during your devotion times. We might call upon God to bring empowerment and healing to their lives. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, this morning we bring you praise and thanksgiving as we celebrate this holy season filled with expectations. Fathers, we remember the birth of our Savior and consider his second coming. It's amazing to think you would love us so much. We thank you, Father, for the redemption of your people through a child. And we thank you, Lord, for having already made plans for our future in your kingdom. We're grateful for the promise your son made his followers in John 14, that he's even now preparing a place for us. And one great day he'll come back for us. That is such good news, Father. And, oh, God, it humbles us to think that your son not only bled and died for us, but that he's also getting our future home ready for us. Lord, help us to recognize that it is this humble and loving path of Jesus Christ that we are called to follow. And Heavenly Father, this morning we, we know that there are those within our city and our neighborhoods that may not know you. We ask, Father, that you would reveal them to us. Make divine appointments, Lord God, that we might have the opportunity to, to share the love of Christ, the hope in Christ that you've poured into our lives. We want to serve as vessels of your grace, Lord God. Be the word in flesh through us, your church. Father, we pray for those who gather in your name around the globe today. We think of those who serve in the mission fields, and we pray that you would continue to provide for all their needs and allow them to see your miracle hand at work in their ministry. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to contribute to these mission needs all over the world through the Methodist Church. We pray also, Father, for those men and women who serve abroad in our military. We ask that you would keep them safe wherever they are stationed. We pray for their families as they celebrate this Christmas with an empty chair. Give peace to these families, Lord God, and grant them hope as we enter a new year that their loved ones will return soon. Father, we know that there are also those who are ill and suffering, those who have lost, lost loved ones. We lift them up to you this morning, praying for their well-being, their physical and emotional healing. We think of those within our own church, those who are recuperating from illnesses, those who are facing medical procedures in the future. May they all sense your love as well as ours for them as you work through them to bring healing and restoration. Father, together with all the saints, we pray all of these things and those things on our hearts in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. to invite those who are assisting with our offering to come forward so we may present to God his tithes and our gifts.
we bring you praise. We, we offer you our gratitude and thanksgiving. And we pray, Lord, that, that these gifts will, will nurture hearts, will mend souls and broken hearts, and, and bring love to this community in ways that, that you have imagined and believed could happen through us. Use us, Father, and use our gifts. In the name of Jesus Christ.
going to invite you to be seated and for all the children to come and join Jolene for another wonderful message she has just for you. Good morning. I want to know how many of you had seal and lobster for Thanksgiving. Anybody? No, I remember being told last week that was what the pilgrims did. So uh, I was just checking to see if anybody had a traditional Thanksgiving. Today, look around the church. Do you see anything different about what's going on here? What do you see? The Christmas tree, the uh, Advent uh, candles and all the decorations around the church. The nativity scene. The nativity scene. Anything else? Yes. Uh, those. The wreath. Oh, what do you see? Do you see something special? Yes, you see the nativity. Well, that's because today is the first Sunday of Advent. Very good. And remember what last Sunday was? Last Sunday was Christ the King Sunday, right, the last day of the the church calendar, the last Sunday of the church calendar, and today is the first day of the new calendar. Advent means coming, an old word for coming. What are we waiting for coming? Christmas. Christmas, right. Christmas being... Jesus' birth. Not only are we waiting to celebrate his birthday, but we are also waiting for the second coming of Jesus. We wait for two things, and we call that Easter, Sunday. At, at Easter when, when we celebrate his uh, resurrection and look forward to his coming again. And so today... And right, no doubt about that. And so today, a family special to the church did something. What did y'all do? They lit the candle and we talked. Okay. Right. They lit. They uh, they lit the first Advent candle on the wreath. And you'll notice that there are four candles on the Advent wreath, and then one in the center that is different, the Christ candle, and we. The pink one, and we're going to talk about that next year, uh, next week. Why is it we have three purple ones and one pink one? And I thank you. And we already have an answer. The pink one is the color of joy. We have three, the color of Christ, purple, and one, the color of joy. Peace is purple. And peace is purple, right. We will discuss all of these different colors and their meanings uh, uh, every week for now till the end of the Advent season. Now, when I was a mother of three little children and we would go on vacation, we would no more than get down at the base of the driveway until my children would be saying, are we there yet? That's right. Or I'm hungry. Or I'm hungry. Yes, that's right. <laughs> she said, "Congratulations, hungry. My name is Georgia." <laughs> uh, waiting is hard, isn't it? And we have, starting on December the first, we have to wait. 24 days until Christmas comes. And to make the waiting easier, Advent calendars have been invented. That's right. And also elves. Uh, well, elves. <laughs> How do they help you wait? Um, they, they hide in places of your house, so when you wake up every morning, you have to find them. And sometimes they bring notes to you. Oh, very good. And also sometimes they bring notes, that, and they hide 12 candy canes around your house. Oh. Well, maybe his elf is different than your elf. Is that possible, that there's more than one elf? Is there more than one elf? For 
every household. So today you get to choose which kind of advent calendar you want to have to count the days. And these advent calendars, if you remember from last year, have a chocolate candy. Uh, you open a door starting December the 1st, and every day there's a chocolate candy piece for you. And when you run out of chocolate candies, it's Christmas. So you have three choices to pick from, and uh, give us a few minutes, and we will distribute them. Now, I see a brother that probably needs to be picked for. Well, he, he will like opening the doors. And I see three teenagers back working the soundboard. Would somebody take each of those teenagers? One? All right. Very good. Please stand as you are able for the reading today's scripture from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out from his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge 
by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by hearing of his ears. But with, for, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with, e with equity for the meek of the earth. We shall strike the earth. We sh he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be shall be the belt of his of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion, and the and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Will you join me in a word of prayer, please? Lord God, our Father, it is my prayer that you will hide me behind the cross of Christ and that my words will somehow make its way into all of our hearts and reflect your goodness, your glory, your truth, your wisdom and bring transformation through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, here we are in the first week of Advent. It's amazing how time has flown by and many of us have just made it through the two most intense shopping days of the year. How many of you were out on Black Friday? <laughs> Not as many as I thought, okay. And of course, decorations are going up. Visions of sugar plums are beginning to dance in children's heads, right? And wish lists are being checked off by stressed out parents and grandparents. But today in this service of worship, we have been confronted with an altogether different kind of vision. Today's scripture offers us a vision of hope unlike anything that we have made Christmas out to be. While incredibly beautiful, this vision may seem like little more than the stuff of fantasy to some of you, but it was just this word of hope that the people of Israel really needed to hear. The words Isaiah wrote about the dry looking stump with a green shoot growing out of it. You see, at the time of this prophecy, Jerusalem had been overrun by the Assyrians and uninhabited. These Assyrian armies were cruel in their conquest, setting crops and trees on fire, which is why we just had a stump remaining, destroying towns cutting off arms and legs and gouging out their captives' eyes. Israel was not only taken into ex exile, they felt hopeless and broken. The words Isaiah wrote told of that despair and yet proclaimed that the door that opened up to future hope for Israel was not completely closed as they were thinking. They were promised by this prophecy that Israel was going to be restored. In beautiful poetry, Isaiah wrote of the time when hope was going to return to all of Israel. He spoke of a world of righteousness. He declared that the people must never give up their hope. But we need to understand that Isaiah was, was not some superhuman messenger living in some state of religious ecstasy. His eyes were wide open to see what Israel was going through. He was quite aware of the tragic reality of his people. And we need to know that Isaiah could just as easily have reached the end of his rope. He might very well have closed his prophetic mind and laid down his responsibility as a prophet and said, too many years I've been doing this, too long without a single sign. I give up, I quit. Get yourselves another prophet who can make you feel better. I'm all out of words, completely out of energy, and utterly out of hope. But somehow, 
Isaiah's gate of hope must have opened because he never quit speaking of the coming messianic hope. He never gave up, even though his prophecy was born out of intense anguish and brokenness. In fact, the prophet fully expected the Messiah to come in his own day. How could he have known that the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy he was desperate to see would be delayed for seven more centuries? Could it be true that that even Isaiah, who gave some of the most hope-filled and eloquent prophecies of Isaiah's or I'm sorry, of Israel's future, also felt personal brokenness from time to time. I think it's quite possible. But the sad truth is that today many people also live in utter hopelessness. For multitudes of people, people that some of them you and I run into every day, They have a face on them that suggests that they've lost all hope. And when one is left without any hope at all, that person is left standing helplessly in a pile of dead dreams. For some, there's much more disappointment in their hearts than hope. But that's why the season of Advent is such an exciting one to me. This is the season when hope can be born within us as fresh as the rising sun. This is the season for shouting, don't give up hope yet. Advent reminds us that Christ not only came 2,000 years ago, he's coming back. And if we seek anything from the Advent season, anything other than crowded malls and full parking lots, and harried shoppers, if we are searching through Advent for anything at all, we're counting on the fact that hope really can flood our spirits and fill our hearts and and just drench our souls and even give us a rush of newfound energy. Christ is going to return, and he is going to make everything right. All that is wrong in this world will be corrected. So why don't you spend time, a little moment, thinking about what exactly is it that attacks your hope? Is it an illness that just won't let go? Or maybe it's family turmoil or grief or loneliness. Maybe it's a failing business. Maybe it's your children. Unfortunately, hope just doesn't kick in all by itself. It just doesn't instantly make us feel better. Holy and divine hope labors for a time, and it moves and and it strives and stirs within us. It, It builds up. Holy and divine hope enters our despairing places and weaves together the those broken pieces of our lives and and you in unexpected ways. Hope sees things that we can't readily see. Most of all, hope discerns every broken moment of our past and refuses to let us view that past as a complete loss or complete failure. I think we all know that this time of year can be a season of depression. Right in the middle of this festive season, it's touted as the happiest time of the year, millions of people are living in a reality that contrasts feasting with poverty and hunger. Some folks are enjoying lavish gifts while others don't have the money to buy any gifts. That's quite a stark contrast. There are those who are having a family feast filled with love and scenes that are so opulent and wonderful. And then there are those that have a family table that's got an empty chair 
that screams of a painful absence. There are those who are experiencing family strife in their celebrations, disorder, and painful moments. For some, this season will not be the happiest time of the year. And maybe that's why Isaiah is such a credible and expressive prophet of Advent's hope because he never saw that hope in his own lifetime. He knew the anguish of unfulfilled expectations. He knew, like we know, the struggle of waiting and hopelessness and helplessness, and yet he believed and told others. You know, I was thinking today that in many ways we're kind of like Isaiah in that we're waiting for a second coming, and we're looking at the world around us and we're thinking, please, Lord, come soon. Can you not see what's going on here? It's true, you and I may not feel like shouting joyful words of hope from the rooftops. We've lived long enough to know that this Advent season is still going to find the homeless folks shivering in the cold and children struggling to survive family violence and people coping with profound loss. Nevertheless, haven't you and I have been chosen to proclaim God's astounding hope to humanity in despair? Are we not also the chosen ones that the Lord has grafted onto the root of Jesse? Peter reminds us in the first letter written, chapter 2, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Maybe we've been chosen to pray and to never lose hope. Maybe we've been anointed to proclaim God's amazing hope to a world bowed down in sadness to every person in our midst who might say, I've given up. There's no point in hoping anymore. When hope is lost, it's such a sad thing because the spirit within a person dies and you get this picture of a lifeless stump, which, which is a pretty good description of the human soul and the human heart. But Isaiah just can't let that go. In this morning's passage, Isaiah uses the unusual Hebrew word for the stump of Jesse, who was the father of David. The prophet doesn't just describe a dead and rotting tree stump. Isaiah prophesies of a stump that remains and survives after a tree has been cut down. A stump injured by the axe, yet not utterly destroyed. The roots are not lifeless. But this stump that looks dry and barren above the ground holds a secret that's hidden under the ground. The dead-looking stump only seems dead. In due time, all would see the miracle of a sprout. The gray bark would show a hint of vibrant green, and the glossy leaves would begin to grow out of that stump that seemed completely dead. This meant something to Israel when they heard Isaiah's words because there were plenty of dead stumps around. What the Assyrians had done to their land to their towns. And it means something to us too. Because you know what? You and I are proof that the stump is alive and well. As Paul says in Romans 15, Jesus descended from Jesse, bringing hope of the Gentiles. That's you and I. And so this morning, this morning, I'm declaring on the first Advent Sunday of 2021 that just when our hope seems all messed up, there's a hidden mystery within the pages of the Old Testament that promises a renewed sense of life to our broken spirits. In today's passage, we read how Isaiah had a clear vision of a miraculous yet unrevealed hope. This ancient prophet 
had a clear vision of the hope Israel so desperately needed, a Messiah that would bring promise to their desolation. So he wrote with a trumpet blast of hope that a shoot was going to emerge from the stump of Jesse, who was David's father, and a righteous branch that would grow from those roots. The hope, as Isaiah spoke of, would come in the form of a little child, a child on whom the Spirit of the Lord would rest, a child that would be endowed with wisdom and understanding, and this child would lead us. That's the promise of the holy season. And if we just open our eyes, we might just see that little child reaching into the deepest recesses of our hearts to relight our own candle of hope, even for those of us who are going through some of the darkest moments of our lives. I'm reminded of a story about a young man named Stefan. He had a gentle spirit and was very kind and generous man. The only thing wrong with him was his heart was broken. You see, Stefan's parents were divorced when he was a young man. This affected his life more than anyone could realize. And he refused to allow anyone to come into his heart. He refused to be vulnerable. So he made up his mind that he'd keep his brokenness to himself and never let anyone in. He refused to allow himself to love or be loved. Well, one day, Stefan met Tracy. She was a tall and beautiful woman. She had a simple faith, and she trusted people and believed that love was the greatest element of life. And she believed that people cannot live without it. But she, too, had a broken heart. A man she'd grown up with and married had left her. After dating Stefan for a long period of time, she became pregnant. And Stefan became furious with her for allegedly putting him in this position. So he turned his back on her. Tracy had already fallen in love with Stefan from the moment they met, but she knew that he kept a guard around his heart so she couldn't reach him and make it right. Then one day, in her desperation, Tracy cried out to God for help. In the midst of her abandoned brokenness, the Lord met her and gave her the encouragement to begin a new life for her and her new baby girl, Alexandra. But deep in Tracy's heart, she could not forget the love she felt for Stefan. She would pray and ask God if Stefan was never to come back to remove this love from her heart for him. But she told God she knew Stefan needed love more than anything and he needed God most of all. Well, several years went by, and Stefan always paid his child support, and he spent much time with his daughter, Alexandra. Alexandra was able to find her own spot in the heart of a man that spent his life trying to shield his heart from others. But God knew that Stefan couldn't refuse the love of his own child, and one morning when Alexander was four years old, Stefan had taken her to school. She jumped out of his pickup truck and saw these three stones laying on the ground. Stefan didn't really see anything that mattered to him. He couldn't tell what she was looking at. And he asked her, what you got there? And she looked at him with her big eyes and simple faith. And she spoke these precious words to her daddy. Daddy, these three rocks are you? Me and Mommy. And Daddy, you need to marry my Mommy. Stefan's heart began from that day to soften. Alexandra had no idea the value and the power of her simple words that she'd spoken that day, but her Daddy did. And his heart began to change. He started recognizing that Tracy had many unmet needs as a single parent, but that he had turned his heart against her. So much time had passed, but Tracy had never given up on him. She determined long ago never to use Alexandra to manipulate him. 
She knew it had to be his own will and desire or she'd never be secure in his feelings for her. So she waited for Stefan to realize what he was missing in his own way and in his own time. And he finally did. On June 1st, 2002, Stefan and Tracy were married. And the pastor told the crowd on their wedding day about the three rocks that Alexandra had found and gave to her daddy. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. The day they got married, the three of them, Stefan, Tracy, and Alexandra, walked down the aisle together to unite their family before God and all who loved and knew them. Alexandra held her parents' hands as they exchanged their wedding vows. And later that afternoon, Stefan told Tracy he was so thankful she had never given up on him. He knew if she had, his life would have been over. And she said to him, I'll never give up on you. I love you. And that, my friends, is a story of Christ's love for you and I. He'll never give up on us. The Bible says a little child will lead them. And that's a story of redemption and love and patience and faith. Yes, Stefan's heart was broken, but it was mended by the simple love of a child. And sometimes that's all it takes. We can all agree that the world around us is facing some serious and even frightening challenges. So what is the church going to do about it? I say let's harness some of that childlike faith within our own souls. With God by our side, you and I can make more of a difference in someone's life than we could possibly imagine. But I have to ask you, before you even attempt to try to make a difference in someone else's life, is that little child leading you? This holy season, allow the holy child from Bethlehem to be born again in your life. Let Isaiah's hope, words of hope, rekindle the flames of your faith. Let God's trust give birth to acts of love and and a giving spirit in your own life. Allow the spirit of Christ within you to reach out to the most broken souls around you. And don't be afraid to tell people about the hope Christ has given your life, the difference he's made for you. Let's proclaim from the depths of our hearts that trumpet blast of hope that our world so desperately needs to hear. That's after all what the church is all about. And let all God's children say amen. Amen. This morning, if the Spirit of God has moved in your life, urging you to become a part of this church family and its ministry to the surrounding community. I invite you to come forward as we stand together and sing our closing hymn of invitation, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates, number 213 in your hymnal. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding 
Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.